Hello again, I'm David Moore, and this is program number two in the series From Dan to Beersheba. And today we really are going to visit the site of Dan. And we're going to recall some of the events of the tribe of Dan, which are really very fascinating, although uh, it is a record of rebellion. I've called it the Idols of Dan because it was an idolatrous tribe for over 1,000 years, including the whole of the reigns of David and Solomon, and all the kings thereafter of the northern tribe, and it stayed as an idolatrous nation until the king of Assyria came and took away all the northern tribes and carried them away to Assyria. Now, the events are based around the book of Judges, and uh, my suggestion is that you read just a couple of chapters of Judges, chapters 17 and 18, read them right through, and that will give you the background of the story. And then you can read just a few verses, just six verses, I think it is, from the book of Kings, first book of Kings, chapter 12, verses 25 to 30. And if you do that, it'll give you a good background and you will be able to follow the things which occur in this video, I think, much more clearly. Once you've done that, we're ready to go right ahead. We're starting off, as usual, with a map to get ourselves orientated. From the north, we move down the land of Israel as it was divided into the tribal territories by Joshua. And we come to the tribe of Dan. Now, Dan had a problem. They were a very large tribe, and they had a very small territory. Their army was 62,700 strong, and only Judah was larger, was 74,000, and Judah had a huge territory. Although their area was small, Dan had a fertile coastal plain which was easily big enough to feed her population and her flocks. And it also had the excellent port of Joppa. Unfortunately, this was held by the Amorites, and there were also Philistine forts along the coast. And despite their big army, Dan had failed to subdue these people. As a result, hostile and powerful enemies lived in the fertile coastal plain, and the Danites were forced to live up in the hill country, which was barren and unproductive. So Dan apparently had not had the spiritual leadership necessary for military success. Anyhow, whatever the reason was, they were in trouble, and they decided to look further afield for some more good land with plenty of space. And they sent out five spies to investigate the possibilities. Having read Judges chapter 17, you'll know the story of the young Levite who went to work for Micah the Ephraimite as his family priest, so I won't repeat it now, but when these spies of Dan went up through Mount Ephraim, they passed the house of Micah, and the scripture says, they knew the voice of the young man the Levite, and they turned in. Why should they know his voice? Well, there are two possible reasons. First, they could have heard him conducting a service in Micah's private chapel, which contained idols and teraphim, and would assume, because of the similarity to the tabernacle service, that he was some sort of a priest. Secondly, he did not speak like the Ephraimites, because they'd adopted some of the speech habits of the Amorites. For example, in Judges 12, verses 5 to 6, it shows that they pronounced S-H as S, as the Amorites did. Anyhow, they seemed impressed by the man and his idols, and they asked a blessing on their journey. And he gave it to them, although how on earth he would know whether they were going to be successful or not, I can't imagine. They continued northwards until they came to the town of Laish, Judges 18, verse 7. Then the five men departed and came to Laish, and saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt careless after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure, and there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything, and they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any man. Now the city Laish is marked as Dan on the map here because that's what it became later. But in the book of Joshua it is known as Leshem. Joshua also records this piece of history, and it shows that although it came quite late in the book of Judges, it was really very early in the period, and actually took place while Joshua was still alive. I suggest you check that in Joshua chapter 19, verses 47 to 50. 
and that should cement it in your minds, and you'll see that the incident occurred even before Joshua was allocated his own personal inheritance. I believe that the five spies could well have viewed the area from a small hill called Givat Har Em, which is not very far from the Mount Hermon range. I spent a night on this hill with my son Nigel in an Israeli ammunition bunker. The concrete floor was not very soft and the mosquitoes were numerous and fierce. This is Nigel preparing the evening meal and I want to make a brief reference here to his incomparable help in making this video. His knowledge of the land, his driving skills and his ability to communicate in useful Hebrew and Arabic phrases made the going very much easier. The mountain glowing with the last rays of the evening sun is Mount Hermon. And on this occasion we found ourselves wondering whether the five spies would have heard the same eerie sound as we did. Jackals. And the previous night we'd heard them at ground level as a large pack of about 50 of them prowled around our very small tent. All that aside, the spies would have looked down on the town of Laish and its lush, fertile suburbs, as the scripture calls the agricultural environs next to a city. They hurried back south to their brethren. Verse 8, And they came to their brethren to Zorah and Eshtaol, and their brethren said unto them, What say ye? And they said, Arise, that we may go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And are ye still? Be not slothful to go and to enter to possess the land. So, as you've read, off they went on the same journey, abducting the young Levite on the way past Micah's house, and in due course they arrived in the fertile country around Laish. You can imagine why the spies were so impressed with the land. Superbly lush and fertile, watered by perpetual springs. The hills of Hermon and Lebanon separated them from Sidon and Damascus, and they had no business with any man. They didn't need to. They had everything they wanted right there where they were. As we look down into this valley and turn towards the south, we can see there are numerous wetland areas down there. Now this is not far from the waters of Merom, more recently known as Lake Hule the scene of the great battle where Joshua destroyed the power of Jabin, king of Hatzor, recorded in Joshua chapter 11. It was very swampy ground, with a lot of mosquitoes, actually in the territory of Naphtali. Early Zionist settlers bought the land from the Arabs around the turn of the century and set about the task of draining the swamps and the lake. Unfortunately, many of them died from malaria. Eventually, thousands of young eucalypt trees were imported from Australia and planted around the lake. They soaked up huge quantities of water and played a large part in the drainage program, which was ultimately successful. Looking at the trees, we felt as if we might be back home in the Australian bush. But these are the descendants of what we might call the gum trees of Merom in northern Israel. From here, we joined the main road and looked across the fields to the tell of the ancient city of Dan. From the side of the road, we can see the site over to the left, and to the right, the slopes of the Hermon Range. That's not Mount Hermon, but it is the Hermon Range. These are the mountains which watered the site of the city of Laish, or Leshem, which was considered so attractive by the spies of Dan. We couldn't walk across the fields to get to the site for a reason which would not have affected the spies at all. This is a typical situation close to any of the borders of Israel today. But a roundabout route took us to a wonderful gate, known as the Gate of the Three Arches. Now, this is a Canaanite gate, built of sun-dried mud bricks, and it predates the Dan invasion of the city by about 500 years. Abraham came here in pursuit of the kings who captured his nephew Lot, and almost certainly he would have entered the city by this gate. Genesis 14.14 14 says, He pursued them unto Dan, and smote them 
and pursued them under Hobar, which is on the left hand of Damascus. Later the gate was thought too vulnerable, and a rampart was built over it. It remained buried for several thousand years, and was only uncovered a few years ago, still almost intact, although only one arch is accessible today. The interior is largely filled with earth to preserve the overall shape. The outline of the original arch is still fairly clearly visible, and we can look on this and wonder that a mud-brick structure built four and a half thousand years ago is still in this condition today. The canopy over it keeps off the rain, which would otherwise permanently damage the bricks. As it is, the gate still stands at its full original height of seven metres, an ancient architectural wonder remarkably preserved. From here we move to the outside walls of the city of Dan, the stones looking as fresh as the day they were built, and almost prompting the thought that they may be modern fakes, but this is not the case, and the walls are certainly from an early Israelite period. This is the actual entrance complex of the city of Dan, as rebuilt by the tribe in the early days of the judges. Those two outer gate towers and walls would have been much higher than this. At the moment they're about two and a half metres, but they'd probably have been at least seven metres when they were built, the same height as the old mud brick gate that uh, we've just seen. You can see there's a large paved courtyard sloping upwards to make it more difficult for attackers. There's also an inner gate in the wall at the back on the left-hand side, and next to it a portico, usually covered by an awning, where one of the city magistrates would sit to judge the people who would assemble in the courtyard in front of him. It's typical of many Israelite cities, early ones, and some Canaanite ones too. You'll remember that Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. The gate looks towards the east, where a lush plain leads to the lower slopes of Mount Hermon. We've already seen the relative positions of the Tell and the Hermon range slopes, and we shall have another look before we leave the area. Here we have the gateway of the city of Dan, which has a very long history. You remember how the uh, five spies from uh, the tribe of Dan went up to Mount Ephraim, they met Micah the Ephraimite and the priest who was there with him, and he blessed them on their way and they came up to this place of Dan, down under the uh, shade of Mount Hermon, which is away to the east, and found a people there dwelling in safety. Uh, they had no idea that anything was going to happen to them. They were Canaanites, they actually came uh, from Sidon, and they were a long way from Sidon. The range of Mount Hermon, which we'll see a little bit later, uh, divided them off from the Syrians, and so they were just ripe for the picking. And so the tribes went back again and uh, collected a whole lot of people, I think there were over 600 of them, and they came back up to the city, which was just sitting there, going about its business, and they slaughtered a lot of them and torched the city. And then they rebuilt it and called it Dan after their father. Now the gate which you see here is almost original. The little bases there holding the pillars, they're original and most of the stonework is original. So this was the, the actual gate which was built by the tribe of Dan. And they stayed here with the images, the teraphim, of course, which uh, the priest had brought up with him. And later on, right after Jeroboam put the golden calves here in Dan, right up until the time that the Samaritans and the northern tribes were taken captive to Assyria. The walls are remarkably thick, about three meters or 12 feet. They were much higher than this, of course. At the moment, they've got a lot of soil on them, but originally they were solid, rock. Just imagine trying to knock down walls like this with a battering ram. But that's what used to be done. Obviously an attacking force would try to find weak places in the wall that were in need of repair, but there are not too many weak places in this wall. Inside the gate, and looking back towards it, we can see the walls of a couple of guard houses where visitors would have had to state their business before being allowed further. Again, the walls would have been very much higher than this, but it's good to be able to see so clearly where they were. Once inside the main gate, there were still other obstacles for the attacker. 
there was an upward sloping pavement to be crossed before reaching the inner gates through a winding passage. And the inhabitants will have the advantage of a downward slope when repelling invaders. This is where the inner gates were hung, and a circular socket down there shows where the gate pillar stood. It also acted as a hinge. There had been another one above it, top of the gate, and another one on the other side. Once again, there were guard rooms, and once past those, it would be possible to enter the city proper along this path. So far, the city itself has not been excavated, but it's obvious that the builders of it were making sure they were not going to be caught napping, like the original Sidonian inhabitants. The next part of the city we're going to look at is from a much later period. We have to remember that the Danites indulged in a false worship using Micah's idols from the foundation of the city in the early period of the Judges right through to the times of David and Solomon. That was a very long time. And the tribe of Dan remained an idolatrous tribe all through it. And the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan the son of Gershom the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set them up Micah's graven image which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. The sad part is the young priest, Jonathan, the son of Gershom, supposedly the son of Manasseh. But Gershom was not the son of Manasseh. He was the son of Moses. And it was the grandson of Moses, Jonathan, who started idol worship in Dan. His cousin was Phineas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, who became high priest of Israel. What a contrast. When Jeroboam seized the throne of the northern tribes, he placed a golden calf here in Dan. The other one was in Bethel. So the system changed, but the false worship did not. 1 Kings 12.28 Whereupon the king, Jeroboam, took counsel, and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. Very recent excavations in Dan have uncovered the precinct of the golden calf cult. To me, it was a chilling experience. The sight of an idolatrous worship abhorrent to the God of Israel, where Jeroboam placed base men as priests because no decent men would accept the position. 1 Kings 12.31 and he made an house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people which were not of the sons of Levi. Most of the Levites, and many people from all of the ten tribes, were so disgusted with Jeroboam that they defected to Rehoboam, and remained in Judah permanently. This plaque says the precinct was used until the time of the Romans. I think that would be hard to prove, but it certainly was used for a very long time. And here it is. That uh, metal structure has been put there by the excavation team to show the height of the original altar. As you can see, it was very high. And the corner pieces represent the horns to which animals were tethered. By using metal strips instead of stone, it's clear as to how much has been excavated and how much has been restored. In this case, nothing has been restored and the metal structure merely indicates the original shape and size. There's a water cistern in the foreground, whether for ceremonial washing or for general cleaning up after the sacrifices, I'm not sure, probably both. Contrary to the law of Moses, the altar had steps instead of a ramp. More steps led up to the high place, the Bema, or Bama, as it's called. The place where the golden calf idol would have been placed, looking down on the proceedings beneath it. Ezekiel refers to the high places in chapter 20, 29. Then I said unto them, Where is the high place whereunto ye go? And the name thereof is called Bama until this day. You are now looking at the actual altar and the actual high place where the idolatrous worship instituted by Jeroboam was carried out. It was refurbished by Jeroboam II quite a few years later and it's his work we're actually looking at now, but 
Be that as it may, the place was used for idolatrous worship by the tribe of Dan for over a thousand years. It's interesting that the name Dan means judgment, and I believe it probable that certain leaders of the tribe down the years will be held responsible for the things which happened here. In this year, on the eve of the 2000 millennium, the remnants of this evil place still stand, and there are no buildings anywhere near it for miles. Well, that brings us to the end of the second program, The Idols of Dan. I'm going to leave you with a last look from the top of the tell at the slopes of the Hermon Range, so often covered in snow, which would melt and cascade water down into the numerous springs and streams which feed the upper reaches of the River Jordan. Truly, this was a land which, as the spies reported, was a place where there was no want of anything that is in the earth.